Matthew chapter 5. We're going to look at verse 5 today as we continue our, our study in the Gospel of Matthew and as we continue our series through what has been referred to as the Sermon on the Mount. Verse 5 says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. As we've been going through this particular portion of Scripture, we have begun to look at what has been called the Sermon on the Mount. It's obvious that it's referred to as the Sermon on the Mount because Jesus is on a mount somewhere in the northern portion of Israel. He's in a, a region called Galilee. And he's speaking at this time to a large group of people. Matthew refers to them as a multitude. And uh, this large group of people have gathered to hear him. Now, as he sees this multitude, he takes the opportunity to present to them things concerning the kingdom of God. Now, that becomes to be a habit of the Lord Jesus Christ, that multitudes gather and Jesus teaches. You'll see it in, uh, again uh, throughout the Gospel of Matthew, but Mark in chapter 6, verse 34 says, Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude, was moved with compassion for them, because they were like sheep, not having a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. And so that's what the Lord would do when given opportunity, is he would speak to the multitude and would share with them concerning the things of the kingdom of God. Now it states to us that Jesus was seated there, which tells us that as a rabbi, he was now speaking with authority, and he gives to them what is called the blessings or the beatitudes. As we've been looking at the Beatitudes or the blessings, the message he gives gives us insight into the steps of coming to faith in him as well as insight into the qualities of a, a genuine Christian. Now, we here in the United States have surveys every once in a while, and people will answer the survey as it pertains to whether or not they have a religious faith. And very often, the highest percentage uh, of response will be in the survey concerning religious faith will be that they have Christian faith. 83% and above in the United States very often will, will say that we are Christians. Well, the fact of the matter is, is many people refer to themselves as Christians, but in reality, they're anything but. They, they haven't been born again. They don't like to read the Word of God. They don't have fellowship with other Christians. They never speak concerning faith in Christ unless it's an argument concerning their religious preference. And very often, these who are arguing out and stating that, that they are Christians, they, they don't have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. They don't have a faith in Him. And so Jesus is actually telling us how one becomes a Christian. And He speaks concerning it in this way. He says, blessed are, are, are those who are poor in spirit. Now, when He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, as I've been mentioning to you, blessed are those who have an awareness of your spiritual poverty. Blessed is the one who realizes that you have nothing to offer God at all. Blessed are you when you stop believing that you can earn or purchase eternal life. Blessed are you when you realize your spiritual poverty. Romans 11, 34 and 35 says it like this. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has become his counselor? Or who has first given to him and it shall be repaid to him? Who first gave to God so that God owes you anything is what Paul is asking. And those who have spiritual poverty are simply those who have realized that we have nothing to offer God at all. I can't bargain with him. I can't say that I've been good. I've been religious. I can't do any of that. And Jesus said, blessed is the one who is recognizing their spiritual poverty for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so with that will come mourning. Blessed, blessed is the one who mourns. Blessed is the one who recognizes that they have sinned against God. Because when we have understood that we are spiritually impoverished, it leads to our mourning over sin, not simply the fact that we sin and do wrong, but primarily because we have sinned against God and we have a personal guilt. Like it says again in Psalm 51.4, against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. And so one, to be a Christian means that I recognize my spiritual poverty. Two, it results in a response of mourning over my sin against God. And then three, it produces a meekness of heart that should characterize a Christian. Now, 
in our society, there is confusion about what meekness really is. Many consider meekness to be weakness, and they don't find the quality of meekness attractive. The Reader's Digest Oxford Complete Word Finder gives a list of synonyms for meekness. Tame, timid, mild, unambitious, retiring, weak, docile, acquiescent, repressed, spiritless. These words are not properly describing what it means to be meek. This is typical of how many people look at meekness, and that's why they find it unattractive. Poverty of spirit, mourning, meekness. These aren't acceptable qualities to possess for many people. You see, the way of the world is to defend yourself constantly, to fight, to argue, to look out for number one, to deflate footballs, to win a game. I mean, that's what the world does. <laughs> Super Bowl humor. But that kind of mentality only produces unhappiness, conflict, and hurt. It runs contrary to what the Lord would have us to be like. In Proverbs 29, 23, uh, it says, A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. Meekness speaks of being mild or soft, the word describes a soft breeze, a soothing medicine. Meekness is a gentleness of spirit, a quietness, a tender heartedness, but it does not mean weakness. The word has an association with domesticated animals, specifically beasts of burden like an ox. And an ox at the plow is not weak, it's strong. The key is his power is harnessed and directed, and therefore meekness is strength that is submitted to an appropriate authority. When you read the Bible, you'll find this interesting, I hope. In the Bible, only two people are ever spoken of as being meek, Moses and Jesus. When you read Numbers chapter 12, verse 3, it says, Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. And in Matthew 11, 28 and 29, Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. So only Moses and Jesus are ever spoken of as being meek in Scripture. But nobody who reads their Bible would ever say that either Moses or Jesus was weak. Nobody would say that. I mean, when you look at Moses, Moses dealt firmly with that Egyptian taskmaster, and he led the children of Israel with firmness. We remember the story of Moses. We remember how that in Exodus chapter 2, the Lord had spoken to him, or rather in his heart he had perceived that he was to lead the children of Israel to be a deliverer. And what had happened is Moses had gone to visit the children of Israel, and while he went to visit them, there was a a Hebrew that was being uh, mistreated by a taskmaster. Now, the taskmasters, and some of you may not be aware of this, maybe you've never been taught this, or it's just it, it hasn't been something that, that you've heard in the past, but the taskmasters, during the time of the uh, Jewish captivity in Egypt, the taskmasters were amongst the strongest and meanest members of the Egyptian society. They would bully the Hebrew slaves, they intimidated them, they were ferocious and frightening, and so with that kind of mentality, they, they were lording it over, and they were the taskmasters. So here's Moses. Moses goes to visit the children of Israel, and he watches as a taskmaster abuses one of his Hebrew brethren. And the Bible's very clear about this. It speaks of how that Moses looks to the left, and then he looks to the right. And then he immediately kills this taskmaster. Don't let that get past you because it's telling you something. You see, what Moses was doing is he already had sized up this taskmaster. He had no fear of him at all. He was simply looking to see if there are going to be any witnesses to what I'm about to do. That shows to me confidence. It shows to me that he had a capacity to take care of business in an instant. He's not even thinking in terms of what is going to happen. 
He's just looking to the left to see who's watching. Nobody looks to the right. There's nobody there. And then he immediately kills him and buries him in the sand. Now, when you think of Moses, you may not be thinking of him in that light because, again, according to Numbers 12, 3, Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. He was the most meek of the meek. And yet, when he saw this injustice, he responded with ferocity. In the book of Acts, chapter 7, verse 22, Moses was learn, learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. One of the things we need to remember about Moses is he was in the house of Pharaoh being raised as one of his sons in line to the Egyptian throne. He would have been trained in everything that would be offered to somebody in that position, which included martial arts. So Moses was, was the Cain Velasquez, we'll say, of the Jews. He was a UFC fighter, a champion. That's what he was. And so when he sees the taskmaster, he's not intimidated at all about it. He looks to the left, he looks to the right. There's nobody watching, bang, it's done. Bury you, off we go. So meekness is not weakness. Meekness is not being powerless. It is power that is under authority. Who would say that Jesus Christ was weak? Anybody who would speak of him in that way is, really doesn't have an understanding of who this man was. Jesus was a carpenter. As a carpenter, he worked with his hands. If he was going to make a table, he didn't call Bethlehem Lumber and say, I'd like to order some, you know, one by fours. He would go out into the forest. He would cut down the tree. He would prepare it. He would bring it. His hands would have been calloused. His back would have been strong. His legs were strong. He walked everywhere he went. And there are times that he'd take a day's journey, and that's 20 miles that he would walk with his men. Jesus was also a mason. He worked with his hands with stone. So his hands would have been bruised and cut up by all that heavy labor and that kind of work. So when you think of Jesus, very often you get caught up of thinking him like some of the pictures we've seen in, in medieval art where Jesus is meek and mild with a lamb over his shoulder and kind of a sad face with a little glow around his head. He didn't glow in the dark. And when you saw Jesus, this was, listen carefully, this was a man's man. He was the kind of man that a fisherman like like the Apostle Peter, would follow. He was the kind of man that had strong men follow him. When you read about the Apostle Peter, on one occasion, he by himself pulls a, a net filled of fish. He drags these, this net up by himself, 153 fish. This was a powerful man, and this powerful man named the Apostle Peter followed another powerful man by the name of Jesus Christ. It was Jesus Christ who walks into the temple you see it in John chapter 2, and then later on in, in Matthew, we'll see that. And he walks into the temple, and he sees what's taking place there with the sale of animals and, and the ripping off of the people for religious reasons. He fashions a cord into a whip, cords into a whip, and he drives them out. He didn't cross his arms and tap his foot and say, this makes me very angry. He drove them out. It is written. My father's house shall be a house of prayer. You have made it, he said, into a den of thieves. This is a man's man. This is somebody who walks in and says, I'm not putting up with this. He didn't do it just once. He did it twice. This is a man who would speak to the religious authorities of his day. And he would speak firmly to them and even refer to them in unflattering terms. You are serpents. You are whitewashed tombs. That takes a strength. So when you think of Jesus as being weak, he was never weak. He stood before the high priest and challenged the high priest when the high priest was questioning him, and Jesus challenged that high priest when that high priest said, tell me about your work and your disciples. And he said, go and ask somebody out there and see. They've all heard. They've all seen the things that I did. Somebody punches Jesus in the face. Do you speak to the high priest like that? If I've done wrong, then judge me for the wrong. But if not, why are you striking me? That's strength when Jesus did that. He's standing before Pontius Pilate 
And Pontius Pilate says, you answer me nothing? Don't you know that I have the power to, to put you to death? And Jesus, looking back at the Roman governor who is trying him, says, you have no power at all unless it's given to you. Jesus Christ was not a wimp. Jesus had strength and majesty about him. And by the way, by the way, anytime you're preaching the gospel, sharing the word of God, and you're coming against the tide of the age, that takes courage and that takes strength to do that because it's easier as a dead fish to flow down the stream, but it takes a live one to go against it. And that takes the Holy Spirit's power in you. But you don't come with an argumentative, arrogant mindset. You come with humility, but you come with the knowledge that the strength you have comes from God himself. Jesus didn't defend himself, but he did defend others. And there are times when the church has to stand up to defend others, the rights of the unborn, those who are being victimized in the society. We have that call from God, and we ought to stand up, and we ought to speak with the kind of conviction that God gives to those who are on the side of justice in that which is right. And Jesus does that. Amen. You can clap if you like. That's the truth. So Jesus would do nothing to defend himself. He didn't use his supernatural or even his natural power for his own welfare because he was meek. Meekness is not weakness. Again, meekness is power under control. In Proverbs 16, 32, he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. He who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. Meekness is a quality of gentleness that results when we see ourselves for what we really are. It results when we become aware of our need for God and cry out for his mercy. It exists when we have spiritual knowledge of ourself. We have understanding. And when our knowledge, understanding, and passion is in balance. Now, meekness is a necessary quality for many reasons. Uh, there are blessings, and Jesus says it here in verse 5, that are coming with meekness. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So it's a necessary quality for various reasons, and we receive benefits and blessings through it. it it's how we receive God's word to be saved in the first place, and it's how we, we grow in our faith after we're saved. James 1.21 says, Get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and meekly accept this word planted in you, which can save you. Meekness increases your joy. Isaiah 29, 19 says, The meek also shall increase their joy in the Lord, and the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. Meekness is how you will live a contented life. Psalm twenty two twenty six 26 says, The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek Him. Your heart shall live forever. With meekness, you become a better witness for Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter 3.15, it says, Sanctify the Lord God in your heart. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, with meekness and respect for men. Meekness. It is, it, it is withholding and it's presenting with gentleness. See, I've had a lot of lessons. God teaches us meekness and he, he's been working in me for a long time in this one particular area, meekness. Because I too have had misunderstanding of what meekness actually is. I was very argumentative. Um, I was arrogant on more than one occasion, but especially so as a young man. No excuse but explanation, I got saved, I was brought out of darkness into light. I was excited about the Lord Jesus Christ and what he does in somebody's life, how he transforms, still in process being changed and all, still learning about him and all, but very excited about being a Christian. And as a young man, I started reading the Bible. I started studying. I started going to Bible college. I started picking up books to help me to understand the elements of the Christian faith. I began to speak to people who would knock on my door and, and bring a false doctrine to me, especially Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses. 
And I can still remember a young man knocking on, at my door. I was in my mid-20s at the time, so it's been a couple of years. And um, he knocked on the door, and I answered the door, Hello, how can I help you? He says, Well, I'm just going door to door sharing the good news of the kingdom. I said, Really? He says, Yes, I'm a Jehovah's Witness, and I just wanted to know if you have a few minutes that you'd like to talk about God. And I said, Sure. He says, Do you know anything? Have you ever heard of the Jehovah's Witnesses? And I said, yes, I have. And he says, oh, what do you think of Jehovah's Witnesses? And I said, I think you're a false prophet. I think that you lie to people and that you're going to the hell that you deny exists. That's what I think you are. Now, isn't that kind? <laughs> isn't that meek? Wasn't that sweet? That was me. I was a cult hunter. Some of you don't know that. I would actually hunt them in my Volkswagen. <laughs> That's the truth. I am not lying to you. I would drive down neighborhoods, and I'd pull over and wait, and they would walk up to my door to talk to me. <laughs> Bang, thank you very much. Let's get it on. <laughs> that was me. I'm serious. I, I, I really was abusive, arrogant, self-righteous, unloving, everything you shouldn't be. That's, that's me as a young man. I, I said, God, you know what? The zeal for thy house has consumed me. I, I want to speak about you. And, and the Lord for years has taught me a simple lesson. In the Greek, he taught it to me in the Greek. I'll tell you it in English. Shut up. <laughs> Shut up. You don't have to win every argument. You don't have to present all that you know. Listen and love them. Respond to their questions and show humility. The things I've given to you are not intended to burn other people. They're intended to show the love of God. Stop having to be right about everything. Stop having to be right in every argument. Have an ear to hear what somebody else is saying and with meekness speak to them concerning the things of God. It has taken me years to learn that. Years. Oh, by the way, I am still more than willing to speak about the Lord and say what is true, but I don't do it with arrogance anymore, I hope. I don't do it with that kind of attitude anymore. I, I want to love the person and, and share, listen, the God that we worship is a God of love. And I, my heart goes out to you because you're out there knocking on doors and writing your 10 speeds and all of that. And, 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 and would to God more Christians would, would have it in their heart to take for the truth what you do for that which is not true. But at the same time, the humility and the meekness that should be in a man's heart had not been in mine. We are not to be arrogant. We're not to be argumentative. We're to be patient and loving as we share the word of God with other people. And that's what God has called us to do. One of the things the Lord has taught me and is teaching me and has taught me to do over the years, and I can share this with some who perhaps will benefit from this one bit of advice or one lesson I've learned, is this, to learn to bite my tongue. There have been times when I, when I have wanted to just share what's on my mind, and I literally, literally would take my teeth and bite my tongue in a literal way. And I listened, and I actually would bite my tongue because it was my way of reminding myself, shut up. Shut up. Shut up. You can do that with your children. You can do that with friends. You, I have learned to just bite my tongue. I've bit my tongue so much I have half a tongue. I have <laughs> bitten my tongue so many times. Because the Lord has said, I don't need your mouth to bring my truth at this moment. They're not going to listen to you, especially with your attitude. So you do me a greater service by saying nothing than if you open your mouth at this moment. 
And I have learned to do that. I have learned to bite my tongue and not to share sometimes, just to listen. Because sometimes people need an ear more than they need to hear my voice. And there, there's a certain with, withholding that, that, there, that you will sometimes need to do. You can feel guilty. I should share. But Lord, haven't you commanded me to share? But the Holy Spirit will prompt you sometimes and will say, not at this moment. Not at this moment. Listen to what they're saying because later on you may have opportunity to share in response to what's being said right now. And so there are benefits to the meekness that the Lord would have us to have in order that we might also be blessed. He says not only that, but he says the meek shall inherit the earth. The meek shall inherit the earth. The word inherit means to receive your rightful inheritance. It speaks of receiving your allotted portion. You shall inherit the earth, your allotted portion. When God created man, he gave to man dominion over the earth. Man was given stewardship of God's creation. And Adam was created to care for creation in a proper way. But when he was tempted, he yielded it up. He yielded up his authority. Luke chapter 4, verses 5 through 7 says, The devil taking him, taking Jesus on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. This has been delivered to me. Adam yielded it up. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid the penalty for sin. He redeemed man, but he also redeems creation. Romans 8, 19 through 21 says, All creation is waiting eagerly for the future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, everything on earth was subjected to God's curse. All creation anticipates the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. So, the meek shall inherit the earth. The complete fulfillment of that work is still yet in the future. One day, God will take the earth out of the hands of the enemy and the wicked who dominate today. You read your newspaper, you see the things that are going on, and you begin to wonder, how long, O oh Lord? It's like what the psalmist Asaph in Psalm 73, verses 3 through 5 says. He said, I envied the proud when I saw them prosper, despite their wickedness. They seem to live such a painless life. Their bodies are so healthy and strong. They aren't troubled like other people or plagued with problems like everyone else. You raised your kid to fear the Lord. Your kid doesn't want to go to school. And the pagan next door has one of those bumper stickers, my kid is an honor student. And you want to have your pagan kid go beat up that honor student. There's something inside of you. How long, O oh Lord? Give them devotions. Pray with them. Take them to church. I do all the things that you've called me to do. I love them for Christ's sake. But they're not listening. How long? I pray. I seek you. I've lost my job. I pray. I seek you. I can't take them to the, to the doctor. I can't afford the medical care. How long? And they don't ever get sick. They seem to prosper. That's all that's going on. I don't understand. Well, Asaph wrote that, and he went on to say in verses 16 through 19, I tried to understand why the wicked prosper. But what a difficult task it is. And then, one day, I went into your sanctuary, O God, and I thought about the destiny of the wicked. Truly, you put them on a slippery path and send them sliding over the cliff to destruction. In an instant, they are destroyed swept away by terror. Sometimes it can seem as if the wicked will always prosper and we, believers, will live in constant tension. But that's not true. God's word declares the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And as believers, we come to the place of simply trusting the Lord to do what is right. God will settle accounts. And so we live by faith and we rest in his promises. And his promise in the future is what belongs to Christ, belongs also to us. We will inherit the earth. In 1 Corinthians 3, 21 through 23, let no one boast of men, for all things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death 
or the present or the future, all are yours. And you are Christ, and Christ is God's. Amazing. Because we trust in Jesus, our place in his kingdom is as secure as his. The meek, because they've received God's grace, live in peace with God now and in the future. Because only meekness will give complete glory to God. Pride seeks its own glory. Meekness seeks God's glory. And meekness teaches us that when we have him, we have all that we will ever need. So blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth.